Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. My guest this week is Stephen Arthurs. Stephen graduated from the Imperial College London with a Master's of Science in Plant Protection and Integrated Pest Management. He also received a diploma in Applied Entomology and went on to get a PhD in Insect Pathology. He did his postdoctoral work at Texas A&M, researching biological pest control for thrips on ornamental plants and investigated insect virus interactions while conducting greenhouse trials to evaluate new insecticides. From there, he worked as a research entomologist with the USDA for five years before becoming an assistant professor in entomology at the University of Florida. He is currently a research associate with Texas A&M University and also a technical sales specialist with BioB USA a leading provider of biologically-based integrated pest management. BioB is the world's leading producer of Persimilis, the most effective natural predator of spider mites. I'm very excited to announce that in conjunction with this podcast release, Kiss Organics has partnered with BioB to offer their wide array of beneficial insects through our website and will be shipping direct from insectary so as to ensure optimal viability of insects upon arrival. In today's podcast, we discuss the many pests we see in cannabis and what some good management options are for utilizing beneficial predatory insects. Now on to the show. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for coming on the show today. Hi. Good morning, Chad. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I appreciate it. So I asked Suzanne, uh, you know, we've been working with BioB now, and I asked Suzanne who to talk to over at BioB, and uh, she mentioned your name. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, um, and then we'll dive into the podcast. All right. Be happy to. So, yeah, my name is Stephen Arthurs, and I'm with a company called BioB, originally based out of Israel. And um, we now have a subsidiary in the U.S., BioB USA. And, uh, yeah, I've been with them for um, about three years now. And prior to BioB, I was um, actually working in research for, for a number of years, most of my career. So it's been a bit of a career change. And, um, you know, I was able to work with a lot of uh, these beneficial organisms, um, you know, in the lab and in the field. And now I'm sort of in the um, very much in the uh, the operational side of things, seeing them actually used in practice. So it's been it's been an interesting uh, full circle. Well, I'm so excited to be able to start offering uh, BioB insects to our customer base. Um, one of the things that Suzanne has drilled into my head is that, you know, insects can't re- develop resistance to being eaten to other insects. Uh, moving away from pesticides or reducing the amount of pesticides we have offers a lot of benefits. Um, I, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to, you know, dive into this a little further. Today, I really wanted to get into uh, some of the main pests that we're seeing in cannabis and what some of those uh, biocontrol options are and, uh, you know, kind of talk about how they work and what they do um, and give people a little more information there. So, uh, you know, why don't we start with, um, you know, just a a classic issue that I'm sure everyone's had over the years, which is spider mites, you know, two two spotted spider mite. How do we, how do we uh, offer, you know, begin to treat that from a, um, biocontrol perspective. Right, right. Well, yeah, sp- spider mites are probably the most common pests that you seem, we've seen in indoor grows. And uh, they can become really bad. I've seen them really um, devastate the, the crop. And once they get bad, they can be quite hard to, to get rid of. And I've seen people struggling with them. So luckily, um, if you do things the right way, the spider mites are not actually that hard to control. The, 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 the key really is, is to be preventative and to, once your crop is clean, it's relatively easy to keep it clean. Um, it's when you have a large problem that needs clearing up where things get a little bit more difficult. But, but in general, the, the, the several species of beneficials, uh, seem to be 
relatively effective and reliable for, for spider mite control. And they're primarily the, the predatory mites. And um, so I've seen a lot of uses of, of predatory mites. Probably the most commonly used one would be Phytophthias persimilis. Uh, seems to do quite well on, on cannabis and hemp. Um, but there's a few others as well that also will feed on spider mites and can be effective in their own right. So you mentioned preventative and also uh, a challenge around if they get, it gets really bad. So one of the things, uh, you know, a lot of this is me just regurgitating things I've learned from Suzanne over the years, is that if it gets really bad, and I'm picturing like webbing in the case of, of spider mites, um, we, we may want to consider a knockback spray, some sort of oil like you know, Suf Oil X or something, and then follow that up um, after the, the appropriate um, interval with a biocontrol. Does that sound like a good approach? Or like, you know, persimilis in this case, does that sound like a good approach? Yeah, yeah. Typically, once you start getting webbing, then now persimilis can work on webbing. It can navigate the, the spider mite webs, whereas other most other beneficial uh, insects and mites can't. So, but 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 because you need a large number, and and because once you start getting webbing, the risk of damage, immediate damage, is very high. Um, most most people at that point would try to bring the numbers down through through the use of sprays. Um, so whether they be soaps or oils would be the the most common common type, and there's various types that that you can use. Um, so yeah, that that would be most common. Um, that can be can be a little bit challenging because the, the webs all can actually protect the spider mites to a certain extent from sprays as well. And so you really need to come in with a pretty high volume, and you need to come in with um, a good coverage. And uh, I have actually seen um, some operations uh, come in with vacuums and try to suck suck them off off the plant, mm. and it's quite time consuming, but. They try to do that as a way to get rid of those webs and some of those very high populations. Um, and in some cases, you know, people will rogue plants if, if they don't necessarily need them and, and they want to just kind of be, be very proactive, they will get rid of some plants. But because of the value of cannabis plants, often that, that's not always an option. But yes, once you brought the numbers down, um, that would be the time to come in with a buyer program. Um, you releasing your, your predatory mites and some of your predatory insects as well. Sometimes they're used for spider mites, and then you really probably want to come in with a high rate, um, higher rate, higher frequency, at least initially, uh, until your problems uh, under, under control. And then pay attention to your new crop coming on, because one of the spider mites do get around through being moved from workers and being moved from pruning equipment and and um, you know, so they can get around. So you really want to be extra vigilant once you have a source, extra vigilant on your uh, surrounding uh, tables or even in your surrounding rooms that your spider mites are are not transferring. And you really want to get that population down to the point where things are clean and then you can go back to a more um, economical rate of, of application. Yeah, and in an ideal world, we're scouting and catching these things early so they don't get to that stage. And um, realistically, when it comes to application rates, uh, a maintenance application or preventive application rate would be significantly lower than, um, a, I guess, a treatment application. Would that be correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> there's a wide range, different r r ranges of rates that are used. And, um, but the most economical rate would be a preventative rate. So when you're basically coming in, you're treating your crop that's pretty clean and your goal is just to keep it clean, just to, to take out those initial populations that are left over or those, or those, um, isolated populations that are either coming in from outside or coming from another room and you're basically preventing them from developing. So that way you could definitely reduce your, your rate down. Um, and, uh, and obviously, it'd be more economic at that stage. But yeah, if you're if you're controlling an existing population, then yes, you need to you need to use the rates. And m most of the companies that provide information will give different ranges, whether it's a curative rate or a preventative rate. And you you can just you can talk to your suppliers or your distributors, and they should be able to advise you. Um, you know, given the stage of your plants, 
And given your planting density and, and how severe your problem is, you know, what might be a reasonable rate to work with, um, depending on your situation. Great. Now, is there anything else that Persimilis is also effective against in terms of cannabis pests? And can you talk a little bit about you know, how we would apply it, like the, the actual application itself? Right. So persimilis is a bit of a one-trick pony. It, it really only feeds on spider mites and a few closely related spider mites in the family. Uh, it does not control russet mite. It does not control um, any other any other pest that you might have. It won't control broad mites. So most 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 IPM programs will have a range of different beneficials to control um, the the range of issues that they're dealing with. Um, so, yeah, so Persimilis really is just for spider mites. Um, and so if you're dealing with, uh, for example, if you're dealing with um, aphids or thrips or white flies or various other, other pests, it's important to have a combination program that, that tackles all of the issues that you're seeing. We, we can talk a little bit more about about that. Absolutely. So how would I, how, how would I go about applying Persimilis in terms of best practice? Right, right. Okay. So, so Persimilis basically comes in several different formats. It, it comes as a loose format in, in, in a bottle, typically in a, in a vermiculite carrier. Um, it also comes in a sachet, a slow release sachet now, which is something that BioB carries. Um, this is often preferred for moms and, um, flowers and, uh, plants in the later stage of grow where you really want to try to avoid contaminating your, your plant with anything that, that could that could cause a contamination. Um, in those cases, the sachets are just hung on the plants. Uh, it also comes in a in a, a, a nipple form, which you can just touch to the plant and release the, the persimilis directly there. I know Suzanne likes that form. Um, that is quite time consuming though, so you have to factor the time involved in going around to every single plant. Um, but yeah, those those are those are the, the, the basic formats uh for persimilis and in terms of how they're applied uh it, for most smaller grow operations um whether you're using the, the bottles you're basically just inoculating the plant with a with a with one or two small doses of the persimilis directly onto the leaves um often that will be done every week or sometimes every other week depending on on your pressure the sachets um they 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 come in two forms. One is a quick release form, which you're putting on plants that already have spider mites. And, and then the slower release form, which, which you can use more preventively because they'll release for about two weeks. Um, and then, um, the, um, the, the, the other, uh, types of predatory mites have used for spider mites. There's one called, uh, Neocytos californicus. That's probably the second most commonly used uh, predatory mite for spider mite control. It comes in the same format, um, which it would be directly released from, from a bottle or from a slow release sachet. And, uh, and again, you know, that, that, that choice typically in veg, in veg, it's cheaper. It's, it's often quicker to release them directly from bottles in veg. And then, um, people will often move to the sachets once the, the plant goes into flower because then, you know, the plant's bigger, there's more area to cover, and there's more concern about contamination. So so oftentimes on mums and on flower, the sachets are probably the most common form I see being used. And then in veg, um, loose material from a bottle. And one thing I do also do see um, with some of the larger operations is that because of the amount of time taken to, to do a treatment, so some growers will actually mix their persimilis. Often they'll combine it with other bios and they'll mix it together and then they'll, they'll put it out with a blower. And that allows you to basically treat um, a much larger area uh, uh, quickly. You're not treating individual plants. You're treating um, several rows at, at the same time. And because these predatory mites are relatively mobile, persimilis is probably the most mobile of them all. It, it really can, uh, it really can crawl along the bench and it can, climb up plants and it can even move between plants. So it's uh, oftentimes in the larger operations, um, putting them out with a blower would, would, would be a technique I see a lot. 
Uh, are there any situations where we may make a preference for Californicus over Persimilis with spider mites? You know, there's a lot of thoughts about this, and, and everyone has their own opinion. <laughs> um, there are some biological differences, for sure, between them, and there may be some cost differences as well, depending on your supplier. The reality is, I think you can use either, um, and <clears throat> you can you can use them individually or in combination. I tend to find that Pristomonas is just probably a little bit more aggressive. It does feed on a higher number of spider mites. It's going to be in most cases, more effective um, when you have an existing population you're trying to bring down. Um, the only issue with Persimilus, it, it's a little bit less tolerant of lower humidities. So if you do grow dry, if you um, have a have a humid, you know, an average humidity, let's say 60% or less, uh, Persimilus may not be able to establish very well in that situation. And you may find if you're growing dry and you can be preventative, Californicus may be a better bet for you. Um, but for the most part, really, you can potentially use use either or, or, or both of them together. Like I say, just Persimilus is just a little bit more aggressive, has a slightly higher spider mite consumption rate, and it's a little bit more mobile. It's a little bit better able to move around than Californicus. Okay, and you could always, I assume, do a combination to really just cover your bases. Um, I guess you, as well. You can. I mean, some people mention that Californicus can feed on Persimilis eggs, uh, which is true. But it, for the most part, you're you know you're mass inoculating these these bugs and um, these sort of interactions that you do see with one maybe feeding a little bit on the other. They don't tend to be. I don't see them generally as jeopardizing your biocontrol program. For the most part, they they can still they can still be used together. I, I see that a lot. So. Um, that that's an option, but um, and the other advantage, I suppose, in California, because the sachets do last a little bit longer, so some people will just use a, like a Swirsky and the California sachet mix. That seems to be very common, and that covers um, that will cover spider mites, and it will also cover thrips control, of course, because uh, and and white fly control as well, because that's those are two pests that Swirsky seem to do a to do a good job on. So again, that would be a combination of Californicus and uh, and Swirsky put together on the same plant. Yeah, now if we were outdoors, would we want to lean more towards Californicus due to its ability to survive in greater environmental ranges? Or do you still are you still using Persimilis outdoors with, with certain crops? Um, so in Florida, there's not too much out, outdoor production of cannabis. There seems to be a bit more of, of, of hemp, but, um, but yes, you, you can, like I get the, the most important thing is, is to, is to look at the, the environmental conditions. If it's particularly dry where you are, um, then if you want to take some advice about whether it's going to be too dry for, for Persimilis, and if it is, then, Yes, you probably want to use a Californicus or um, some growers also like to use Andersoni. I forgot to mention that one. That's another one which is uh, commonly used on cannabis for spider mite control. Um, it has similar characteristics to Californicus. Um, now, both uh, Andersoni, Swirsky, and Californicus can also feed on pollen. And so, in some situations, if outdoors, you know, pollen occurs naturally. They may do, you know, it blows in and they may do a better job in establishing on plants that are pretty clean because they're able to survive longer without food. And they're also able to feed on things like pollen, which which Persimilis is not able to do. So having a longer uh, duration of survival on the plants um, can be an advantage in, in certain situations. Um, it just depends. You know, I, personally, I find that Persimilis, it doesn't live very long if it doesn't have food, but it does a pretty good job at knocking your spider mite populations down to a very low level, or even eradicating them locally. So you really have a bit, of, sometimes have a little bit of a breather time before the calif before the spider mites will reestablish. And so you don't necessarily need to have life proof similar on the plants at all times, as long as you're inoculating your plants frequently enough that the spider mites can't get a foothold. So... Yeah, I don't really think there's one size fits all here. I think mm -hmm. different people have different preferences. 
But I think I mentioned some of the things you need to look out for when you're deciding which predatory mites to use. No, that's great information. I mean, it, I, that's one of the things about biocontrols that I think people struggle with and, and why we need experts is because it is a little more subtle. There's a lot of variables to consider when making a decision. So this is this is great. So, you know, you kind of covered persimilis in pretty good detail um, and also talked about Californicus. Now, you mentioned Californicus also has some suppression of uh, broad mites. Maybe we could talk a little bit about broad mites as a transition into another target pest. Yeah, yeah. So broad mites are, are not as common as a problem as, as spider mites, but they certainly um, they certainly do get on on cannabis, and they're they can be a little bit more insidious because they're kind of a little bit smaller. They're a little bit more cryptic. You know, often they'll sort of hide um, in the growing portions of the plant, or they run along the mid vein. And when they first get in, they're not so easy to see. You do want to look out for the symptoms on the plant. They can cause crinkling and defamation on the on the young parts of the plant. So you're probably going to see the symptoms of broad mites before you actually see them. Um, but yes, luckily broad mites are not too hard to control. Um, a lot of growers, I think, with cannabis, they find it useful to in their program to include something that's going to feed on broad mites. Even if they don't necessarily have broad mites, um, you don't want them. And some of the, the predatory mites, um, Swirsky is, is pretty effective at broad mites. Um, to, uh, California also can feed on broad mites. So having something in there in your program that will um, be able to take control of broad mites before they become a problem is, is a good idea. Great. And is the application for California similar to Persimilis? Are there any differences there for you know these mites in general? Um, no, not, not, not really. Um, the, the, the formats, uh, different suppliers will, will have different formats, but, but most of them come in, uh, a range of different bottle sizes. Sometimes there's differences in concentration. So you may have, um, you, you want to look at the, the, when you're, when you're planning your program, you want to look at the different bottle sizes and the different concentrations and, um, if you if you want to put on a relatively high rate, you want to get a fairly concentrated bottle so that you're not having to put a lot of extra carrier on the plants, which is not necessary. Um, on the flip side, if you're if you're trying to apply to plants that are spaced and you've got a large area to cover and you're going to use a blower, then you want to make sure you've got enough um, volume to distribute the, the the mites you want sufficiently. So you may need to use a larger bottle or a slightly less concentrated form. Um, so yeah, there's a range of different sizes. Um, I, like I say, I do find that, that, that a lot of cannabis growers like the sachets, um, for various reasons. They're a little bit more expensive. So I work a lot with ornamental growers and they're always, you know, very, very price conscious. Mm -hmm. Um, and the sachets is a more expensive way to apply the same number of mites. Um, but in cannabis, because of the value of the crop, um, that's not necessarily so much of an issue. And so, in situations where having a sachet is advantageous, and so certainly in moms and in flower, um, then you know a few extra cents per 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 plant for applying a sachet is, is not not really a big deal. Yeah, so the sachets make the application simpler. They um, may give longer levels. You correct me if I say anything wrong here. Uh, longer time intervals of prevention, uh, depending on the type of sachet. And uh, they also keep any sort of carrier like vermiculite off of our trichomes in this case. Is there any other advantages to sachets that I'm missing here or something that I may have misspoke on? No. So, the, yeah, the main advantages would be um, the, 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 the extra time of release. So in the case of things like Californicus and Cucumorus and Swirsky, most sachets typically will give you a month of release. Um, if they're in a humid situation, you can get up to six weeks. Um, and um, so, yeah, lo longer duration, um, lack of lack of the carrier on the crop. Um, and also, of course, once the sachet is on a plant, most sachets have a date on them. So you can see which plants have been treated. Um, when you're applying a small amount of carrier on, on a leaf, that, that may blow off or drop off. 
you know, the next within a few days, uh, unless you happen to keep records or know, uh, it's, it's you don't have that immediate um, ability to go up to a plant and determine when exactly when everything was applied. So that would be um, that would be another uh, advantage of a sachet. The other one, of course, is if you are spraying, and I know a lot of growers do still when they're using buyers, they still like to come in and spray. Uh, sometimes perhaps more than they need to. Um, but what, keep in mind when you're spraying, um, even if you're spraying soft materials like, like uh, soaps and oils, these are still um, going to be killing your, your predatory mites. You know, they, 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 they're killing your soft body beneficials as well as your pests, at least situations where you're spraying them directly. And of course, the sachet is generally a waterproof. And so anything that's still inside the sachet when you're sprayed and, and comes out subsequently once your spray is dried, um, that can be a better way to combine sprays and bios is, is the use of the use of sachet. Yeah, that's a great point. And also a reminder to folks to make sure that what they're spraying um, works well with bio, with beneficials. Um, you know, I know Suzanne's a big fan of Ceph Oil X uh, because it doesn't have a lot of residual effect on the plant and, you can, and your beneficials can re, re-inoculate pretty quickly into a space. Um, so, yeah, she she also mentions on the on the flip side that neem oil, for example, may um, deter beneficials from re-inoculating right away. So, just something to think about when you're thinking about what to spray. Um, getting back to though uh, the, you know, you mentioned Californicus um, will work with two spotted, also with broad mites. Um, are there any other? target species for, for Californicus before, or anything else for treating broad mites that we want to talk about before we move on to another pest? Uh, yeah. So, so one thing we should probably talk about, oh, by the way, before I forget, you made, you made a great point with the sprays and, and Suzanne's point about neem oil, which can be repellent is, is well taken. Um, if you are going to be spraying and using bios, it's, it's very important that you do it in the right order. You want to spray first, release bios subsequently, not the other way around. Um, just keep that in mind. But um, yeah, broad mites, um, two of the common uh, solutions for broad mites would probably be, be uh, two species of predatory mites. That would be your Swirsky and your Cucumorous. Um, these are both, they look very similar. They, you know, you, you can't tell them apart by looking at them, but they, they both broadly do the same thing. Um, Swirsky is a little bit more flexible, but they both will work for broad mites. And just keep in mind, um, if you're using your your your, your bios um, and you're using either Swirsky or Cucumorous, it's really important to keep in mind that they have different temperature uh, activity profiles. So Swirsky is a more uh, sort of tropically adapted species. Um, it, it, it can handle higher temperatures. Cucumorous is, is one that's used a lot more further north um, and, and used in the winter in the south, perhaps. It's, it, it does a good job if your temperatures are going to be in the range of sort of 50 degrees to upper 70s. Uh, Cucumorous, that's its sweet spot. It will be active. It will control your broad mites. If your average daytime temperature is going to be in your 80s and your 90s, um, then yes, you definitely want to be using uh, Swirsky because that one is can be better adapted to the warmer conditions. So you definitely want to keep that in mind um, uh, for for uh, for mite control. Great. And since you mentioned Swirsky, um, you know I'm I'm cheating. I'm looking at one <laughs> at one of your mm-hmm. uh, sheets here. Uh, it's also a uh, Swirsky also works quite well against thrips. It sounds like uh, immature thrips. Yeah. I'm reading. Um, maybe we maybe we move on to thrips next since that's another common problem here in cannabis oh yeah yeah oh thrips thrips can definitely um be problematic uh and you know that again they can be hard to spot early on they, they can be a little bit cryptic um so yes it, there's a few things about thrips one is um there's a number of different thrips we'll get on cannabis and they're not all the same some of them are easier to control than others um and so definitely if you got thrips you know figure out which ones you have and if you're not sure um you know, you know, work with your uh, your consultant or your you know your supplier or whoever your local extension office. Make sure you know which search you're dealing with. Um, the 
thrips are best controlled again, sort of preventatively. Um, you made a good point. A lot of these predatory mites feed on thrips. Swirsky uh, and Cucumorous would probably be the two main ones that are used for thrips. Um, they they only eat the smaller stages. Um, Cucumorous really only eats the first larval stage. Swirsky can feed on um, most. They can also feed on the second larval stage, but they're not going to be, for the most part, feeding on the adults. So your adults are still going to be out there potentially laying eggs. So that's why it's important if you have thrips that you're maintaining a coverage of your predatory mites um, continuously, because you, what you want to do is 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 you want to prevent all of that all of that reproduction of the thrips that's going to go on in your crop. You want to prevent those larvae from ever really developing, uh, and so you need to maintain a fairly constant source. Whether that you know typically that would be weekly, either sachets that will continuously release. Uh, your predatory mites for a while, or if you're not using sachets, you probably you have a thrips issue. You probably want to come on every single week um, and and be releasing your predatory mites. Um, and if you have the other thing about thrips is, is that uh, especially when you have an, a fairly established infestation, you probably want to add something for the soil stage as well, because your thrips want to get into the soil. Your predatory mites are not going to be feeding on those, so you've got thrips coming out from the soil. Um, you know, they, they, they have a quiescent stage in the soil and then they develop into adults and they come up and then they start laying egg, eggs again. And it's not until those eggs start hatching then that you're going to be able to start controlling them. So you've, a better way to break the life cycle is to add something for the soil stage. Um, and we can talk about that. There's several soil predatory mites and insects which will feed on thrips. And in that situation, if you have an established infestation, you probably want to be using something both for the soil stage as well as for the stage on, on the leaves as well. Yeah, let's talk about that. What would you recommend then for a soil application if dealing with thrips? Right. Well, there's, there's three main, main things that people use. Um, <clears throat> one of them is another predatory mite, which is uh, it's got their rather long name, Stradiolalaps summitus. It was actually formerly known as um, hypoaspis, so a lot of people still call it hypoaspis. It's uh, it's a bit of a larger mite. It's it's in a different family. It's in the Lalapid family, um, and it lives on the on the soil. It doesn't really get up onto the leaves. And it's a generalist. It will feed on things like springtails and um, thrips larvae and, and fungus gnats. It's probably used mainly for fungus gnat control, but it will feed on those stages of thrips in the soil. So adding something like that would be a good idea. There's another one, a rove beetle, which is very popular. Um, it's called Delosha or Athida. And that's another good one. It's very mobile. It can actually fly. Um, in situations where you have maybe you're not growing as clean as you want and you have things like thrips and fungus gnats perhaps that are re that are populations that are coming from the ground maybe you've got weeds or you've got some dampness where you've got algae and things growing maybe that's a source of pests it'd be good to clean it up but using some of the rose beetles can be good in that situation because they'll get around they'll get into those corners and they can even establish and they'll they'll they'll, they'll be a good thing to use on in that situation um, and then the third option is, would be the beneficial nematodes, which we didn't talk about yet. Mm -hmm. um, but again, they can be used in propagation. Uh, you can drench the, the plant at any stage, potentially if you have thrips, but typically that would be something that you would use in younger plants. Um, if you have issues with thrips and fungus gnats, and you would come in um, and you could definitely uh, incorporate nematodes in that situation as well. Yeah, and which nematode would you recommend for dealing with thrips? So there's several species of nematode. The, the, the one that works best with thrips is uh, Spinonema feltii. Um, we just, we just, because people have such a problem pronouncing some of these names, we just call them by their letters, so mm -hmm. SF. Um, and that one, that's probably the one that's primarily used for thrips. It, it works relatively well. doesn't like it hot. Um, once you get temperatures in the sort of upper 80s, it doesn't really work too well. So it's something that you want to try to use uh, in the cooler part of the day or the cooler part of the season um, or, or have some kind of cooling in your grow, in your operation. Um, but yeah, that, that's the one. Keep in mind that they, that they, these things need to be kept, uh, they don't, they don't like it too dry. 
So you need to be put on a high volume. You need to keep the, the media wet uh, for several hours. They don't do great in things like rock wool and anything where you have a very fast draining system. Um, soilless media, they don't work quite as well. But So take some advice um, from your supplier about your situation and, and make sure if you're using a nematode, you're using them in the right way. Um, there's a few little things to watch out for with nematodes, like they can clog in filters and they um, they can drown if you mix them up and leave them sitting around for a while before using them and that kind of thing. Yeah, now when you mentioned temperatures, you're talking about soil temperatures in this case, since we're talking about nematodes. Is that right? Right. Okay. <clears throat> yes, yes, that's, that's right. I mean, ideally, yeah. we don't have, you know, it, we're not in the 80s anyway with our crop. Um, at least indoors in terms of soil temps just to keep cannabis happy. But, um, yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. So, um, we're kind of jumping around, I guess, a little bit here. Um, was there anything else regarding thrips that you wanted to talk about? Um, well, I should mention, um, one of the species of thrips, it's often it's called Poinothetia thrips or Echino thrips. It's, it's a dark, fairly dark, slim looking thrips. Um, that it doesn't really get controlled very well by any of the buyers. And in that situation, you really need to have a, have a spray program or an alternative program to target those. Um, so again, you know, make sure you know which threats you're dealing with. Uh, I do have, uh, some growers that I, that I know they, they do like using Aureus. Aureus is a, mm. is the pirate bug. Um, and you know you may be you're probably familiar with it. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's a generalist, but it's it, it does like to feed on thrips. Um, now there is a question about how persistent it is in cannabis because if Aureus doesn't find anything to eat, it, it kind of doesn't really hang around, and of course it can fly, so it can disperse. Um, having said that, some growers they use a lot of it. It's it's a generalist. They like to have it around. Even if it's not very persistent, um, for them, it's, it's a good insurance policy for adult thrips because, of course, it will feed on the adult thrips as well. And um, there are also other ways we can maybe talk about a little bit, but there are other ways to encourage and keep some of your buyers around uh, in the crop longer by feeding them. Um, and so that always would be an example of something that you can actually potentially feed using pollen or a Festia eggs, or um, a product that BioB has is uh, based on a, a type of decapsulated brine shrimp egg, which Aureus just love. I mean, I've got videos of them going to town on this stuff. They can reproduce on it, and it's a lot less expensive than than um, a Festia eggs. And so there are potentially ways to, um, you can buy, for example, you can buy Swirsky that contains the food in the bottle. So when you're putting it out, if they don't necessarily have much to eat um, in the crop, then you are giving them a food source um, application, and that helps keep them happy and re will reduce their, their ability to spread and fly away. So, yeah, so I should have mentioned Aureus there. Um, but, yeah, I think that's, that's, the, the main, that's the main aspects of FRIPS, I think, we covered. Yeah, I want to highlight one thing you said, just as a gentle reminder to folks, too, is that um, it always starts with identification. Like you mentioned that there's various types of thrips. Some are controlled certain ways um, or maybe slightly differently or less controlled uh, than other species. So take the time to scout to get proper identification, which is not necessarily posting it in a Facebook group asking, what is this blurry photo? But, you know, make sure it gets in front of an entomologist, someone that can actually give you a positive ID and then come up with a treatment plan based on that information. So again, this is stuff that just Suzanne just drills into my head. <laughs> so it's been, good. yeah, yeah. Well, Suzanne's been doing this a long time and, you know, I, Suzanne's probably, probably the best out there at, at, at what she does. And, um, I know one of her, <laughs> one of her pet peeves is some of the misinformation that can go around on, um, some, some forums and chat boards and, and, and that kind of thing in the cannabis industry. You know, there, there is some bad information out there. And, uh, um, there's also lots of good information, but of course, knowing which is which and getting, uh, getting a good idea is, is really important because, um, 
you know, that's like the first thing you, you really need to do. Because I, I do see people, you know, maybe applying um, for similar when when the problem they have is not spider mites or something like that. Mm-hmm. You're, you're potentially just wasting your money. So, yeah, that, that's a great point, Pat. Yeah, you know, I hear these stories about facilities either, you know, doing uh, massive over-applying of beneficials because they have the wrong rates or, you know, and sometimes that's from, uh, you know, a potential consultant or the issue is they're just not applying the right insect for the right problem. And then that's where people get into this idea that biocontrols don't work. So, um, you know, I'm grateful because I'm not an entomologist or, or anywhere near an expert on this. I'm grateful for some of the people on my team that are more knowledgeable than me, but then also having resources like yourself and Suzanne and, and other people at BioB that I can, you know, get a positive identification just to back up, uh, you know, my own knowledge as a way of um, making sure that my recommendation is going to be on target for what what's actually going on in a room. So. Yeah, thank you. I just, <laughs> I just wanted to go back and touch on that because too many times I think people get ahead of themselves or they, you know, they see a problem on a leaf, they post a photo, uh, you know, of a blurry insect, they think it's one thing and then it turns out, you know, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's innocuous, it's just a soil dwelling mite or maybe it's uh, not what they thought it was or a different species. So yeah, just wanted to go back and touch on that. So, okay. Uh, moving yeah. on, unless there's anything you want to add to that. <laughs> yeah, and there's just one real, real quick thing that related to what you just said that that is good to keep in mind. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of people sending pictures all the time of different things, and um, you know, so many times the, the picture quality is just low. It, it's very hard to identify things without a good photo, um, especially mites. You know, mites can be hard to control, uh, hard to identify. Um, without even from good good pictures um so you know sometimes you need samples so yeah so id is important getting good quality photos is important um and then another thing you said which which i see a lot is especially you know especially once you're growing and if you're growing in hoop houses or you're growing outdoors you get a lot of different incidental things that can come around and then a lot of them are not problematic you know i i see various um various bugs that will just come in from outside and you know maybe they'll even feed on a, a leaf for a little bit but they, they don't have the capacity to reproduce so they're not going to be a problem so by all means get everything identified but don't feel like just because you have a particular bug in the facility that that's necessarily something that you need to spray for or control it may be something that's just innocuous and you just need to keep an eye out for it um because the more you spray, um, the more you're going to be impacting your, your beneficial insects. So making unnecessary sprays is probably just as bad, if not worse, than not making, than in, in some ways, than making missing sprays that you need to make. So <laughs> use what you use what you have as as a guide to what you need to do in terms of your own particular facility. That's a great point, um, especially about having a high quality camera because it's 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 hard enough to identify these mites much less with a blurry photo so it's definitely worth the investment getting a a decent camera to take a good photo and a lot of times your phone camera just isn't gonna isn't gonna cut it um one other thing that you you mentioned was you know people treating for things that aren't problems well you know we work with a lot of growers doing um what people are calling living soil. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Stephen. It's this idea of, mm-hmm. of reusing soil, typically in beds, um, and managing the fertility in it over time. And so we do see a lot more insect life in these. You know, you'll see a lot of uh, orbited mites, or you'll see people um, that'll spot, you know, mold mites that may come in with a, you know, beneficial insect application. And it's just important that we we get the right ID there. And that's I think that's where we always have to start. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do see or about it mites. Um, they, these are often people, what the heck are these? And they're, they don't, you know, they, they, they're, again, they're often just a secondary issue. Um, I also see uh, typh- typhophagus mites coming in, um, various different things that are really just pretty innocuous. Um, so, so, yeah, yeah. And I think one thing you mentioned earlier, which were the um, isopods. Again, that's a, that's an issue which I haven't personally seen, but I know that can be 
I don't know whether you want to mention those or not, but that can be um, sometimes some of these soil soil issues you have are, are very much reflect, you know, how you grow, whether you recycle soil, how much organic matter you have. Um, and um, and I think you said that you've seen sometimes those can actually be, be causing damage as well. So that was interesting. Yeah, when we see really high levels of organic matter in a soil, um, sometimes those populations I found can get out of control and actually start um, chewing at the at the stock itself. Um, you know, one or two, probably not a problem, but you know, I've seen it where there's like hundreds or probably thousands in a given room. They just get out of control. So that's where I typically recommend um, mass trapping. Um, and you can even put like a sticky, sticky tape or traps around the stem of your plant to help kind of just stave off that damage, um, while you're trying to get it back under control. But there aren't, as far as I know, a lot of good options other than maybe reducing their food source by removing some of that organic matter or that cover crop or something else that they may be surviving off of. I don't, did you want to add, add to that? No, I mean, I, I, I like the idea about, um, mass trapping and possibly changing your um your how how you grow what soil you use um more than coming in and trying to spray them away um i like that idea more but uh um but no that was i don't really have anything any direct experience with using those so um yeah yeah we'll also see super high levels of spring tails sometimes which again are not really problematic um, but, but I do see a lot of photos of those showing up online and I have seen them in a couple of grows I've walked into. I don't know if you want to touch on that. Some of the things that you list actually, um, feed on springtails, some of the things that we talked about, it sounds like. So I thought that was yeah. interesting. Yeah. Springtails are not normally an issue, but if they get into be high numbers, um, you know, there is some, some evidence suggestion that they can vector some, some fungal diseases, um, if they get to be high numbers, there are certainly some species of springtails which will feed on young roots, potentially can cause damage. Uh, again, you know, there's lots of different springtails. If you have a lot of springtails, um, I would probably caution about doing something about them. Um, and again, some of the the, the 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 predatory insects we mentioned earlier, the the rove beetles as well as some of the the, the Stradiolalaps mites, they will feed on them. And again, that's something that you might want to consider putting in if you've got a lot of springtails just to just to reduce the risk of, of some of those problems happening. And that's a good point that some of these insects can be vectors. Um, so that's something to factor in as well. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, let's, you know, we haven't even talked about some of the major pests that I think people are going to tune into this podcast to want to hear about. So let's just knock out um, a, probably one of the most common ones. Um, and, and definitely not one of the more damaging or worse ones to have to deal with, which is just fungus gnats. Um, give me your thoughts around, around fungus gnats in terms of how you like to treat it. So fungus gnats shouldn't, should not be difficult to control. And you shouldn't really be in a situation where you're having a lot of fungus gnats flying around. Um, um, most, most fungus gnats, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a few ways to approach fungus gnats. First is, um, are you, you know, are you growing too wet? Um, fungus gnats, of course, they, they're feeding primarily on, on algae and, uh, and, and, and fungi that grow on, on the soil, or they can also grow, of course, on the non-crop area on the ground if, you, if your facility is not too clean. Um, I've, I've also seen them coming out of, um, water walls, feeding on water walls and things. So, um, so having a, having a clean grow, not growing, you know, not growing too wet is, is, is the, the primary thing. Fungus gnats are pretty, pretty easily controlled again by, by the, the Stradiolalaps mites we, we talked about, the rope beetles, and again, the, the Stenomythotia nematodes. All of those things, um, will control fungus gnats pretty effectively. So the only thing I would perhaps add is that if you have an established infestation, fungus gnats have quite a long life cycle. It can be a month or more. And most of the biocontrols, you're really only targeting the larvae. So you've got potentially a fairly long-lived adult stage, pupil stage, and egg stage that are not being targeted. So it can take a while for those to cycle through. 
So if you have a lot of fungus gnats, and I've certainly seen this in greenhouses, it can take a couple of months or more um, before those numbers drop down. So, you know, some people might want to come in with a with a with a, a, a pyrethrin spray and try to knock down the adults. Um, definitely putting up sticky traps will help um, monitor and to a certain extent if you if you put you know sticky rolls all the way around you can you can help bring the numbers down more quickly. But in general, um, fungus gnats should not be too too difficult to control. Yeah, I I like the idea of SF nematodes um, as my primary way of dealing with them, but I, I'm glad you mentioned a couple other ways of, of treating for them. We see them quite a bit in because we use compost as a fraction of our soil mix, and it's really mm -hmm. inevitable when we have organic matter that's been outdoors at some point in time. Uh, you can't have all the biology in the compost and then not have the potential for fungus gnats and vice versa. So um, it's, it, you know, seasonally will become an issue sometimes, um, which is why, you know, pre-treating with SF nematodes or being on a maintenance schedule as a preventative just makes it really easy because you don't get to that, hopefully that mass trapping infestation stage where you're having to, having to think about spraying and, and things like that. But yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Fungus gnats can come in on eggs on, on media. If you're buying in media, unless it's sterile, um, mm -hmm. it's not uncommon for fungus gnat eggs to be in the media. And sometimes they'll, they'll, they, they, they'll hatch once the media gets wet. And so you're, you, that's where your, your source can, can come from, like you say, or if you have your media outside, it can get contaminated that way. So in that situation, you'd probably want to treat, um, you'd probably want to treat your young plants for sure, with a drench for nematodes. Um, one of the new products, actually, that we have is a nematode in a in a capsule, which um, mm -hmm. uh, is a slow release capsule, and that can actually be incorporated into your 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 plugs or your media, uh, your young plants. Um, and the advantage on that is it allows you to have a, a a long application of nematodes during that critical period when the plants are putting out their first uh, roots, where Drenches can be a little uh, disruptive. You don't want to disrupt your plants when they first start rooting. Um, and so uh, in that situation, you can actually incorporate these nematode capsules into your into your media, uh, um, and then you don't have to drench, but then you've still got the extended release of the nematodes. So that's, that's something new we're kind of excited about. So, um, so yeah, that's another, that's another option as well. You don't want to drench. Yeah, it's called the Nema Plus Depot 200 is the product you're you're talking about. It's 200 capsules, 320,000 nematodes per unit. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just come out in a the until now it's come in these tiny little packets with about 200 capsules in, which is fine if you've only got a small number of plants. But I think now it's now becoming available in a, a bag of 32,000 capsules. Oh. So that's a little, that's, uh, I believe that should be available sometime in the next month or so. Um, so that's something that, um, you could maybe put on a, on a potting line or something and, uh, and, uh, treat every plant, uh, as it's being stuck or uh, depending on how you, how you grow. Um, so that's, so that's exciting. And again, that can be potentially automated as well. Um, I've seen these then put on auto automate, automation lines where uh, every pot gets treated with a few capsules um, as part of the production line. So that, that's uh, that's kind of a I think where the future would be for fungus mat control. So I haven't I haven't seen this product. Um, can you describe what it actually looks like, and then also how you how you apply it? Like, are you burying it in the soil? Is it just going you know? relatively close to the surface? Are you watering it in? What what can you tell me about it? Yeah. 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 Well it was developed for the it's actually developed for the for the home uh for the um house plant market where people would would, you know, maybe they'd be going away for a few weeks on vacation or they they'd want to treat their house plants or fungus gnats, but they didn't really want to be spraying or you could just get a few of these capsules, make a little hole few holes in the soil, put them in, cover them up, and then you, you you're good to go. Um, in the ag market, which is kind of the new market for, for these things, um, it's not 100% clear what the best 
how to use them, but I but what seems to be the best way is just to put them on a potting line um, and or put them in your plants when they're first um, uh, when they're first um, planted um, and they the capsules have to be in the media that you can't top dress so you know either you put them in the planting hole when when the plant goes in or you incorporate them into your potting mix you mix them into your potting mix and then that potting mix is pre-treated. Um, or you find some other such way to incorporate them uh, into the into the top uh, into into the parts where they have to you know sun device to make holes and then put them in. So it, it's not it's not clear to me. It would depend on on everyone's situation. But um, and like I say, this is kind of something new. But uh, I really see uh, uh, this being a very useful tool where people can just kind of get their get their fungus mat treatment done straight away when the plants are first uh, stuck and they don't have to worry about it for m maybe at all. Um, if those plants are big enough and uh, got enough root system, by the time the capsules are done, maybe fungus gnats are no longer a problem. But if you do have to come in and drench with nematodes later on, um, the roots are fairly well developed and, and if the drench is not going to be so disruptive. Yeah, but, yeah the we, other... should talk, we should talk about that more. Yeah, the other thing that you made me think of too is in a facility, it reduces, I, I would think, employee error in application. Um, you know, potentially not getting an even application of nematodes across all your plants, or you know, mixing and not not properly applying to where you may be damaging your nematodes. Um, I, I think that's really interesting as a reason to potentially use them. I'm picturing like a. Um, like a fish oil capsule, is that anywhere close to what they actually look like? Yeah, they look a little bit like caviar. Um, the capsules are made from food grade material. It's like a calcium alginate sunflower um, uh, oil emulsion in the middle. So you can eat these things if you want. I, they don't taste good. I tried it, but um, <laughs> they're, uh, they're it's all food grade materials, um, and they're pretty persistent. And you know they 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 store well in the fridge. Um, they just look like little kind of little um, uh, little soft um, capsules of of like caviar or something like that. Um, and okay. they they come in these bags and and uh, yeah, we're excited to see where this goes. Very cool, very cool. Um, well, I want to save time for what's what's sort of new. Uh, from BioB and, and what you're seeing in the industry. But I also realize we at the very least need to at least touch on, um, or maybe I need to do another podcast with you on, uh, we haven't even talked about hemp russet, canvas aphid, or root aphids uh, as the main three, and then caterpillar leaf miners and white flies as sort of more minor pests. Um, what, what would you like to, what would you like to ta tackle next? Um, well, we can mention hemp russet might briefly, um, that that one can be a problem, uh, if it gets well established, it can be a, can be a problem. And that's one that really, um, you know, that there's some debate about what role bios play, but for sure, I would, I would think that if you have an existing infestation of hemp russet mite, you, you've got to have a, a spray program to deal with it. Um, stuff oil X. Um, and sulfur sprays, um, some other um, uh, paraffin oil type sprays need need to be done. Um, you know, you can potentially uh, dip your dip your clones. You need to you need to deal with that problem. It, it's not going to get any better. You have to be aggressive. And once your hemp russet mite populations are under control, then there 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 is some uh, evidence that having something like Worski or cucumerous in the mix can potentially help prevent your plants becoming reinfested with new sources of hemp rust that might coming in. But I know this is something Suzanne's got quite strong opinions on, um, that the beneficials themselves are not going to be an effective way to get rid of an existing infestation. But don't 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 wait around if you've got hemp rust that might like I say it tends to get worse mm -hmm. um, and you need to have a, a strategy for for dealing with it. So um if you apply it in the right way, it's not that difficult. But um, but uh, yeah, Cephalo X I think is probably one of the best uh, treatments um, out there. 
for to, to, to deal with an existing problem. And also example of where you need a really good camera or scope to, to, to spot them. I mean, they're very easy to identify once you have the right tools, but without the right tools, you'd be struggling, I think, to make a positive identification. Yeah, they're probably the smallest pest that you're going to be dealing with in, in cannabis. Um, they really are, um, even with a 10x hand lens, then they're, they're, they can be hard to see. So, uh, yeah, you, 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 that's a situation where you might want to get, get your little dissecting scope out or something and get your samples under there and dig around and find them. Because um, the same with broad mites, you know, the russet mites and broad mites. Uh, are often two di- misdiagnosed problems. People will see an issue on a plant and they'll just say, well, that must be broad mite or, or that must be rusted mite. The truth is you actually have to find these critters and confirm that they're on the plant before you can be 100% sure. Um, they're not easy to get a positive diagnosis without actually finding them because you can get other symptoms um, that can cause potentially similar, uh, other things that cause similar symptoms. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Make sure you, you identify them. Okay, well, moving on then. Uh, cannabis aphid and root aphids. Okay, well, these are other, these are uh, um, uh, two more difficult pests. Um, mm-hmm. If you're going to get aphids, my advice would be to get cotton aphids and green peach aphids. Um, they're <laughs> easy to control. <laughs> if you're going to get aphids, um, not that they can't be a problem if you don't treat for them, but they, they bios work very well for those. Some of the parasitic wasps, um, they're really inexpensive. If you have them as part of your program, um, then you shouldn't have too many issues with those. Cannabis aphids are a little bit tougher um, to control. The bios don't work quite as effectively for those. Um, now, if you do use parasitic wasps for aphids, um, they do the, the common types of parasitic wasps which you're using for your common aphids, they will parasitize cannabis aphids, just not as effectively. Um, but having having them in the mix will definitely help slow slow down the risk of cannabis aphid going crazy. And when it goes crazy and it starts spreading, it can be a real problem. Um, so cannabis aphid, yes, you, you know, you want to have, <clears throat> there, there's, there's several approaches. A lot of people at this point will bust out the sprays and they'll try to spray it back. Um, and again, you know, you, that can work. You need to get the good coverage and you also need to be aware of what impact you're having on your other bio program when you're doing that. Um, what I see also now is that some growers will use predatory insects for, for cannabis aphid. And I've seen a lot of interest in using lace wings. Um, lace wings now are more readily available. They're relatively inexpensive and you, they can be put out in large quantities as, as eggs in mixed in with things like predatory mites. So people would just say, hey, we're just going to add some lace wings into this mix. And um, lace wings are fairly mobile. They can get around and they're, they will definitely feed on cannabis aphids. Um, so again, you have, a, you have some different options there. Um, I've also seen lady beetles released in, in cannabis for, for cannabis aphids. I would not generally recommend those. They only ever really work if you have very, very high populations. You don't want to have your your cannabis aphid population getting that high. So well, and, um, and let's also yeah. touch on the fact that most commercially available lady beetles are wild harvested, which is not a great practice and not necessarily something that, as a consumer, we would want to support for its you know vector of disease and environmental damage. Um, though I, I hear there are some commercially available lady beetle available they're just really expensive yeah yeah there there is one company that does um rear the convergent lady beetle which is the one that you're referring to it's normally wild collected um artists they 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 do rear it in culture but it's very limited supply it's very expensive Mm -hmm. um and um uh, yeah, yeah. So I, honestly, like lace wings are probably going to be a more reliable, more cost-effective way of, um, of a, for, as a generalist predator for aphids than 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 ladybugs. Um, okay. Definitely, I, I would go more down the the lace wing route than the ladybug route. Um, you know, but I, yes, yes. Go ahead. 
Oh, I just wanted to mention, I've had some friends have success with heat treatment with cannabis aphid um, by just you know, massively overheating their rooms. They've been able to knock back populations that way because it, it is a really, really tough pest um, to deal with. It, it just it just keeps coming back, it seems like. And so uh, that's just one other suggestion I wanted to throw out there. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I don't, I don't know what the exact temperature you'd have to get to. I'd imagine you can probably want to get it up into the mid 40 degree Celsius range or something mm -hmm. before you, uh, for a few hours probably to kill them. That's a, that's a great idea if you can do that. Um, one really important thing about cannabis aphid, which you need to keep in mind is that it's, it's, uh, it's monaceous on cannabis, right? So whereas other aphids are going to maybe fly in, come through a window, come in on, come in on a weed, um, come in on someone's clothes. Cannabis aphids, they can only really come from, um, from, from cannabis, um, and, or, you know, cannabis plants in the cannabis family. And so, um, if you have it, you gotta figure out, well, where did it come from? Because it didn't just fly in through a window. And the other thing to keep in mind is if you, means if you can get rid of it, from your from your facility, then as long as you don't bring it in again, you, you don't have it anymore. So there's more um, there's more motivation to make an effort to, to to try to get rid of it because if you can get rid of it and not bring it in, you're done. Your problem's over. So mm -hmm. that's another thing to, to to keep in mind. Um, well, the other I thing have, too, yeah. I think you that you brought up a minute a little bit ago was this idea of identification again. Uh, just to harp on that, I know, you know, aphids can be color morphs, so you can't necessarily get a positive ID just based off the color. Suzanne's been like, Tad, you have to send me a close up of their genitals, you know, when I wanted an ID once of an aphid. <laughs> so I, I know that it's a little more complex. And I, so I just want to, again, suggest that people get a positive ID before jumping to the conclusion about what the aphid species is uh, that they're necessarily seeing um, on their plants. Yeah, yeah, great point. So both thrips and aphids, uh, you need an ID. Um, at the sure. species level, at, you're saying, versus... At the species, yeah. Cannabis aphids aren't that hard. What you want to do is you want to look at their head. They have these little horns. And they're, they're, they're actually tubercles kind of between their eyes, and they, they look like little devil horns. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's not really any other um, aphids on cannabis that have these. So um, once you see these, um, that's a pretty sure bet that you've got cannabis aphids. Great, um, that's a good so, pointer. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. The dreaded root aphids. Uh, right, right. <laughs> these might be the most frustrating. Um, I don't, cannabis aphids pretty frustrating. So is hemp russet, but this is definitely in the mix. I feel like, mm -hmm. uh, what, what are your thoughts on root aphids? Root aphids are, I always used to think, you know, if you've got root aphids, you need to er eradicate them and just get rid of them. Um, because, it, but the more I think about it and the more I see how difficult they are to get rid of in, in established, um, grows, I think a lot of people are just kind of living with them now. And then, you know, and, and they can be managed to, to acceptable levels. Um, um, <clears throat> if they're not managed, then yes, they, they, they the issue with root aphids is they tend to get they tend to get in on on your stock on stock plants. You know when you've got plants around for a long time, the risk of them getting established root aphids seems to increase. And then what happens is then they they start bubbling out of the stock plants and then they fly around and then they'll make their way um, to to around the facility and then they keep kind of spreading. Um, and so you're always kind of like putting out little fires. So um, Root aphids, you have to have, um, you have to figure out where they're coming from and you have to use root drenches to try to maintain, even if you can't eradicate them, um, you should be able to maintain them at pretty low levels with, with root drenches. And so most cannabis guys, they use some combination of, of Botani Guard and PFR, um, and, uh, sometimes azadirachtin. Some of them will mix in nematodes, and there's there's some evidence that nematodes can infect root aphids um, in the lab. It's not clear to me. There is there actually is a little bit of research suggesting that they're helpful, but it's not. It's it's pretty limited. But regardless, um, 
some combination of root trenches are definitely needed. Um, typically, you know, at least weekly while you have decent populations of root aphids. And, and even after that, at least every other week to keep them suppressed. Um, in combination with that, you need to be scouting for root aphids on the, on the flowers, uh, on the, on the plants, and you need to try to stop them. Cause what will happen is then they'll move down to the roots and then they'll start another source on your roots on your other plants. So you want to be maintaining your root aphids on your source so that they're not bubbling out and expanding. If the population stay relatively low, they'll stay in those roots. They won't spread. It's when you get large numbers that they'll start crawling out, producing the, your, wing forms and then spreading and that's what you want to stop um in terms of the bios um we know that that um the the, the, the soil dwelling predatory beetle the roof beetles and and the predatory mites can and and do feed on root aphids i've seen them um but they're not going to be an effective control by themselves they simply don't get deep enough into the soil they're just going to help stop your root aphids from spreading on the soil surface line and maybe in the top layer, they're not going to be eliminating them. But I would say combining your some so, some predatory soil insects and mites along with your root drenches is, is like a first step for, for root aphid control. Yeah, I think they're one of the most persistent insects, pests I have to deal with, um, just based on my experience working with various facilities that are battling it. And, and really, like you mentioned, in a lot of cases, it just comes to maintaining them at a threshold that's below, you know, an, an economic, an economic threshold where it's, it's low enough that we're still getting a good harvest, we're getting the yields we want and, and the plant stress isn't necessarily too high, but it is really hard to get rid of, especially in facilities where we're reusing media and things like that. Um, it's a tough one. So it's good to know that there's some options there. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, I mean, the, Root aphids um, can be controlled with some pesticide drenches as well. It's just, and um, they can actually be relatively effective. It's just not clear to me that how many of these products are going to be registered by your state. So some people will make off-label applications. Obviously, we don't recommend that. But mm -hmm. um, but there are, and so Bovaria is definitely one that most cannabis growers can use. And I mentioned that one too. Um, but things like Mainspring and Endeavor can also be somewhat effective. It's just not always clear to me if that they're going to be registered for you by your state. So um, you have to look at that. But uh, I've certainly seen those things being, being used as well as trenches. But yeah, your point is once once they're established, they're, they're, they're hard to get rid of. If you can get in there early, um, you may be able to eradicate them from your facility. But uh well, Once they're fairly well established, that, can be, that becomes quite hard. One other thing you touched on was with Bovaria, and I've been having longer conversations with Suzanne, and um, she's been sharing information with me from some you know, larger companies uh, that do pathology and things like that. And they found with that there's various commercially available Bovaria, and, and some of the products on the market um, may not contain a spore level that's that's high enough to actually get suppression. Um, so you want to buy a reputable source. Botanigard's a great product, for example. Um, but there's other ones on there that may not be as, as effective. Or she even mentioned there may be a product on the market where the spore count is, is higher than could physically fit by volume in the container. So um, <laughs> it, it's a little, you know, the world of microbials uh, and biostimulants is a little bit unregulated still at the moment. Um, so you, you want to make sure you're going to the reputable source there on the Bavaria, but it is something that works really well for dealing with root aphids too. So just, just a little tidbit I, I've been learning about lately. Um, let's, let's talk about, uh, what you're most excited about in biocontrols and some of the new stuff that you're seeing. All right. Well, um, you know, it's it's a fascinating industry. It's, there's a lot of changes going on. Um, you know, where I, where I see that where I see the biggest um, adoption um, and growth in the biocontrol market is is definitely outdoors. Um, typically, it was very much a high value kind of greenhouse commodity. You know, cannabis is its own 
of course came along with very few pesticides and, and, and it's been a big adopter of biocontrols and it still is. Um, but where I spend most of my attention these days is um, on the field act side of things. Um, how can we use some of these beneficials um, outdoor for food crop production, you know, in areas where they really haven't been used before, at least when it comes to putting them on naturally, because they occur naturally, but um, in terms of actually manipulating them and putting them out. So that's really exciting. Um, there's a couple of things that have, I think, driving that one, driving that difference. One is the greater availability of biocontrol agents and more species available. The costs has come down in some places. Um, and then another another technique which has opened that door is, is the use of drones. Um, there's now a few companies that specialize in putting out bugs by drone so growers can hire them and they'll pay on a per acre basis and um, uh, you can apply biocontrol agents to a crop. Um, you know, you could treat 100 acres in, in a matter of an, an hour or two, whereas there just wouldn't be the manpower to do it by hand. So it's opening the doors. Um, as I've seen that happen to a certain extent with, with field grown cannabis and, and hemp. Um, not so much where, where I am, but out west, um, where there's more field grown hemp and cannabis, then I know that that, that is starting to be done. And, um, so that's exciting, you know. Um, I also see um, more and more adoption and more and more people, I think, using biocontrol as well, um, not just throwing a few things on and then spraying and hoping, but actually like having a good program and and uh, cannabis is, is, you know, some of the bigger cannabis growers now are very knowledgeable. You know, they, they're great. They, they really know what they're doing and uh, their, their insect identification skills are good and they, they understand the business. So, um, so that's also exciting to see because I think, just a few years ago, there was perhaps a lot less um, understanding. So I, you know, I credit Suzanne, of course, our mutual friend Suzanne. She's she's been one of the um, leaders in in getting good information out there. But but yeah, yeah, it's been it's 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 been exciting, and uh, I'm happy that our you know company has been able to um, take advantage of of some of the uh, some of this industry because, of course, we'll have to make a living, right? <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, you know, there's very few actual insectaries out there that are actually producing bugs, you know, bio bee being one of them. And so, you know, there's many, there's many people like myself that say are, you know, already do or going to be like I am uh, distributing insects. I'm not actually an insector. I'm not rearing anything. Um, it's actually quite difficult to do from everything I've learned from Suzanne about the process. So, um, one thing to mention when people are sourcing insects is is try to get them direct from insectary or from a distributor that's going to ship directly from the insectary. So there's other distributors that will receive a larger population of, of insects and then repackage them. And that repackaging, uh, while maybe convenient for smaller growers, can reduce the viability of the insects. And you, it, it's important that they arrive hungry and alive so that you get the effects that you want. So I just wanted to touch on that too. Yeah, yeah, that I've I've seen that definitely um, with some of the um, uh, some of the online um, sources, which are very easy to find and very easy to get bugs shipped um, very quickly. But you're right that they they do sometimes get stored for longer than they longer than they need to, and so getting dead bugs is not uh, it does happen. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, you need to have a good supply um, and um, make sure that what you're getting is good quality and it's it's fresh and it's alive. And um, w whether you go work directly with a with a with a with a, a producer such as ourselves um, or a distributor that maybe will drop ship, um, so that you're still getting um, material sent directly from the source. Um, so some things store better than others. I mean. Um, yeah, but when it comes to things like predatory mites, um, uh, persimilus, for example, um, uh, they, they, they really need to be fresh. You don't want them sitting around for more than a day or two before you use them. Um, so yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. That's a great point. You know, it's important to work with someone that can give you the information you need as well as uh, a good source of 
of um, fresh products. Yeah, yeah. We, we've been slower on on launching this. I'm I'm kind of going to time our launch with this podcast, but there's a lot of challenges around it because um, one, it's having a staff that is knowledgeable enough or has the resources to get the answers to make sure that the recommendations are accurate. Um, two, it's you know having the relationship with with like in our case with you guys to make sure that we are sending things directly from the insectary. We're not playing middlemen on um, receiving packages and sending them back out. Um, and, and then the most challenging part is the shipping because these things are alive. They need to be shipped overnight. They can only ship out on certain days during the week to make sure that they arrive um, mm-hmm. in a timely fashion. And then um, having that information for the grower so they make sure that they know, you know, they're there to receive the package and know how to apply it. There's just a lot of steps involved there. And a lot of the cost is shipping. So you may pay more in shipping than you may for the insect itself. So uh, trying to coordinate and make sure that the website can handle all of that has been a real challenge. Um, And also make sure that the process works smoothly so that at the end of the day, the customer is getting something that is going to perform as, as it should. So. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a great point. I, I would say if I had to just give one general tip, um, you know, the people maybe out there that are considering using buyers, um, one thing that's really help that really helps the process work a lot more smoothly is, um, you know, rather than going out scouting on a Monday, finding some bugs, and then deciding what you know some pests, and then deciding on Tuesday what you're going to put out and hoping to get them on Wednesday, and then being frustrated when you can't. Um, if you can understand what your issues are historically going to be in that area or what are likely to be and come up with a preventative plan that covers those, at least covers your basic options. You can add, add, add something down the road if necessary, but, and then work with someone like yourself um, to determine how many you need and get that ordered, get that on a program, you know, have that ordered every week or every other week or something based on your, your production program and, and get it, get it set up in advance. You know, that way, once, once you have that, the, the, the risk of delays, the risk of things not being available, the risk of not being able to get what you need when you want it is so much less. And, and it's just a much more reliable program um, than just kind of being reactive and dealing on a, what do I need today kind of thing. Just set it up as a program to cover you, at least cover your basics, your, your spider mites, your thrips, if you're going to have them in the area, your fungus mats, you know, cover your basics and, and uh, set it up uh, as a program that's just so much easier for everyone uh, when it comes to shipping. That That's a really, really great point. And um, one of the things Suzanne and I discussed, too, was to have an option for growers that I was actually going <laughs> to I was going to talk to you about uh, was to set up a, a, a maintenance uh, option that's maybe a combination of a few different biocontrols that would be set up by mm-hmm. square footage so that a, a mm-hmm. customer could go on the website and say, I have a hundred square feet or a thousand square feet and then have a given rate or package that we could then recommend based off of that for, you know, this preventative maintenance sort of uh, application. Right, right. And you could potentially have a ship, a, a central point of being sh- shipped you know, you could have everything sort of shipped as one order and then distributed um, amongst the various customers potentially, you know, and that would that would be a, a cheaper way to, sh- so you're not shipping lots of little boxes, you're shipping a smaller number of larger boxes. Yeah, well, my thought was, you know, for a, a given, let's say just a facility or a given grow would be to have a combination of a few different insects that I would know fit in a certain size box um, so then I could have the website calculate accurately so someone could check out by square footage, for example, um, and not mm-hmm. necessarily have to worry about having to figure out exactly what they need because we could give them at least a good starting preventive program for people who want to start using biocontrols that maybe had a problem and now oh, right. we're starting a new run and they know that you know, they're potentially going to see, you know, they have a historical historically had to deal with say two spotted or thrips or whatever. And we can come up with a sort of a program like that, that they can put out that would be a little bit more of a generalist program. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great idea, Todd. I think we can, we can do that for you. Definitely. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry. I kind of dropped that on the, <laughs> in the middle of a podcast for you. So I'm, I'm excited uh, 
to do that. And I, I actually talked to Suzanne about it and she's like, talk to Steven and then uh, she'll give her a thumb of approval and we'll get that out on the website. Awesome. Um, awesome. So last thing, if you have time, I, I wanted to just really quickly touch on your feed because you mentioned, you mentioned it briefly and I think it's really interesting um, that you guys have some ways to feed the insects, the beneficial insects that, you know, people may already have bought or may have naturalized in their area. How would we incorporate that into a program? Right. So one thing I like to do is, uh, for example, um, when we supply Swirsky, um, I like to recommend the Swirsky version that contains food already. Um, Simply because I've seen, you know, it, it just lasts better on the crop. It's, um, it's, uh, you know, you're providing a, a food source at the time they're put out. You don't need to mix anything. It's very straightforward. So that that would be like an easy way to do it. Um, and it, it can also that can work with aureus as, as as well as cucumerus as well. So that that's really the, the simplest way to do it. There are other feed products as well on the on the market. People can experiment with but um i think you know people don't want to do anything that's necessarily more complicated if you can just get a different bottle that contains what a food source in it um uh, and you're working with a crop that's pretty clean so you you don't have a whole lot of pests for for your beneficials to, to feed on then i find that just makes sense you know it's just it's not a huge cost increase um and i've just seen the results in the field work work so much better so if um, I had if yeah. I had a small grow, I could order the you know the the insects I need, whether that's you know Swirsky, Cucumaris, the lacewing, Aureus, and then get this uh, bioart feed at the same time, save mm -hmm. on this you know massive shipping cost, and maybe keep them alive a little longer by shaking out some of the uh, direct directly applying the feed you know to the leaf surface so to keep the plant to keep the insects alive a little longer i guess is what i'm getting at extending the time yeah. between orders right right absolutely so yes you can just buy the feed by itself and apply some to the crop when when you're um, applying um if you're using a blower you can just add it to the mix that you're blowing out assuming of what you're blowing out was compatible with the feed um uh so those are two ways to do it and uh um you know, I, I would definitely, I, I might not necessarily do that in, in flower because of, you know, risk of contamination, but definitely in veg. Um, if you're using, if you're putting out predatory mites and lace wings and aureus and things like that in veg, uh, add a few dollars and put some of this feed in. It really, it, it makes a big difference to the, the length of time that your buyers can survive and, and how effective they'll be. So I've really, I've really seen it, it work, work very very effectively in that situation. Awesome. Well, I, I really appreciate your time today. We've already <laughs> gone longer, but yeah. this was sort of a complicated podcast. So I really appreciate your time. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add before we uh, sign off? Um, no, I, if anyone out there is interested, um, uh, you can go to www.biob.us and we have a uh, quite a lot of information on our website now, new information. Um, about products and different uh, application strategies. So by all means, check that out. And um, you can also um, uh, you can also reach me at stephen.arthurs at biob.us if you need to. And um, but no, I enjoyed it, Tad. It was great, and uh, I'm really glad that we're connected. And I appreciate your. I checked out your podcast. It's really good. So I'm very happy to be on it. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you. I really look forward to working more closely with BioB uh, in the coming coming days and months, and uh, being an opportunity to provide you know more of these high quality insects directly to our customers. So, thanks again. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you, Tad. You too. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. That was Stephen Arthurs with BioBee, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. 
If you like the podcast, please leave us a rating and review and give us a follow on Instagram. You can also sign up for our newsletter on our website homepage to stay up to date on the latest research and information. Thanks for listening.